I invite you to open a Bible to Matthew chapter 11 as we continue our sermon series looking at what the Bible says about rest because rest is commanded by God. It's this gift from God and our problem is that we know we need it, but we often reject it. All right, so as we dive into God's word this morning, I want to ask you two questions. How many of you have ever made a bad decision in life? And I, by bad, I don't just mean like sinful, like evil, like that was mean to do, right? Another way of saying it, anybody made an unwise decision, right? Like it was just kind of foolish, right? Now here's the second question I want to ask you. How many of you didn't learn your lesson and made the exact same choice or decision a second time? Anybody ever done that? Right? Like... Whoa, that was really dumb. Why did I do that? That was so foolish. Why would I think that? Why would I behave like that? And then you tell yourself, I'll never do it again, right? Sometimes you tell God, I promise I won't do it again. So maybe you hurt somebody or offended somebody and so you, and you care about them, so you apologize and I promise I'll never behave that way again. You all know what I'm talking about, right? And then what do you do? I mean, sometimes there's a week or two in between and that's good. But a lot of times we end up making the same unwise, foolish decisions over and over and over again, even though we wake up and realize, well, that was so dumb. Why did I do that? So I have a Bible verse that explains this because I love the Bible. I tried to make this verse my confirmation verse and they said no, but it's still one of my favorites. All right. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, like a dog that returns to his own vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Isn't that great? It's kind of gross. And that's kind of the point, right? Like a dog eats its own vomit. And if you've ever had a dog, you know that happens and you're always like, this is disgusting, right? And it's, that's what it's like. It's saying like, we, we are like that dog. It doesn't make any sense. It's not good for us. It's gross. It's foolish. And yet, what do we do? We, we keep making these unwise choices. We keep making poor decisions and, and returning back to them. Even if we kind of suffer consequences and correct ourselves for a little bit, it doesn't always last, right? So anybody ever been told by a doctor, <clears throat> you need to get healthier? Show of hands. Let's just all be in this together, right? Some of you aren't raising your hands, make us all feel bad about ourselves, okay? All right. But I've been told by doctors more than once because the fool returns their folly, right? You need to change the way you're eating. That's always fun, right? And then you need to exercise more, right? Now, my experience is the doctors usually use leading questions. I love my doctor, she's awesome. But she uses leading questions like, so what have you been eating lately? Which is like, look, you know obviously not good. Otherwise you wouldn't be asking me that, right? Now here's the deal, when the doctor tells me, <clears throat> Mark, you need to exercise more, eat healthier. We've got to get some of your blood levels and things like that corrected and in better, better numbers and all those things. If you've ever been to a doctor, you've experienced that, right? Here's the deal. I have a choice in that moment, right? I have a choice where I can say, okay, that is a wiser, better way to live. I will be healthier. Odds are I'll live longer and feel better if I do these things, right? If I take these medicines, if I eat better, and if I exercise more, right? We all agree, right? Now go and do it, okay? But <laughs> we all agree, right? Or I have another choice. I could tell the doctor, yeah, but doctor, the way I've been doing it is fine because I've gotten this far, right? I could just say, well, why should I change? Like, why should I do anything different? Like, you know, I can keep doing the same things because look, at, I've made it this far, why change? And in the Old Testament reading and in the gospel reading, Jesus through God's word is presenting us with a choice. He's saying there's, there's two ways to live in this world. And he's offering us the one that, that gives life makes life better, makes it more full and, and joyful and eternal. And then there's this other way of living that doesn't, right? It, it leads to unwise choices. It leads to difficult circumstances. It leads to us suffering in all kinds of ways. It leads to us being exhausted. 
And we have a choice. That's what Deuteronomy says. I present to you today a choice. Life and good or death and evil. Now, if it was so black and white, how many of you would just be like, well, obviously, I'm going to choose life and good. Show of hands. Like, if this is a multiple choice test, you're just like, yeah, that's what I want. All right? Over death and evil sounds like not good. So I don't want that. But here's our problem. Just like the people of Israel in Deuteronomy, like, we foolishly don't always choose life and good. We don't always choose the life that God is offering to us, the, the way of living that he's offering and inviting us into. What we often choose is the way of death and evil. And when it comes to rest, the Bible talks more about rest and not just a, you need a nap, but I mean, we probably all need a nap, right? It would be good if we could take a nap. It would be great. But it's much deeper than that. It's not just a rest of, man, I'm physically tired and I, and I need a power nap to get through the day. It's talking about rest for our souls, rest for our lives, the way we actually live, the rhythms that we go through in life. And we began last week by talking about it and asked you, like, if you have a busy calendar, right? And that's kind of the, the way most people introduce themselves or think about their lives. You ask them, what's going on in your life? The first thing that most people are going to say is, I'm really busy. You got all this going on and that going on and this going on, right? And you wake up every week and it appears like there's more stuff just popping up and coming at you. And we know here's a wise way to live is to slow down, find rest. Take a breath, take a break, right? Right, if you were talking to a doctor, they would say, hey, here's, here's some things you need, right? You, you need to get more rest. How many of you already knew that? You're like, yeah, I, I could take a nap. Right? But what we do, like Proverbs says, is we act like a fool and return to our folly. We're like, oh man, I, I knew I should have taken a break. I should have relaxed. I should have said no to this thing. I'm, I'm stretching myself way too thin. And then what do we do the next week? load up the calendar, right? Like get more stuff done, keep going, keep going, keep going. And what Jesus is offering to you and me is a different way of life. It's totally different than the, the way the world works is the way the world works is this pressure on us, right? To always be what? Busy, always be doing, always keep going. You say, well, I've got something better for you. And so in Matthew chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 28, these very famous verses and sayings from Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. So if you feel like you need a nap, if you feel like I'm a little tired, I've been going, 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 I'm worn out. My schedule is chaos at best. This is an invitation to you. Welcome, right? One of the things that people misbelieve and misunderstand about Jesus and the church and Christianity and faith is that, no, it's for the people that are always doing good, always have everything together and, and don't have any problems. And Jesus is flat out making an invitation and a promise saying, here's who I'm inviting. Everybody who is laboring and everybody who is heavy laden. It's a fancy way of saying anybody that feels worn out. You ever gotten to a point where you're just, I'm just tired, right? Anybody ever taken a nap or gone to bed? Here's a good one. This is one of my favorite Sundays of the year because it doesn't make me get here earlier, all right? We gained, right? Everybody always says we gained an hour of sleep last night. How many of you woke up this morning going, I feel an hour more rested? Or any, how many of you woke up before your new alarm clock because you're just like, Whatever, I'm getting up, right? I don't, right? There's this lie that we gain this out, right? And so if you and I have ever been worn out, we, we're like, well, man, even if I've taken a rest and I still wake up exhausted, right? That's what Jesus is getting at. You're, you're, you're burdened, you're heavy laden, you're just feeling weighed down in life by everything that's going on. He's saying, I have a promise for you. I have an invitation for you. A, a, a way to a better life. The, the words of Deuteronomy, life and goodness. Rather than just being worn out and exhausted all the time. 
So this is a wonderful promise. This is a promise of Jesus that's meant for everybody. For you and me and anybody else that feels a little worn out by life, a little beaten up by circumstances that aren't going their way, Jesus is like, no, I want you to come to me because I have something to give to you. And so he's going to promise three things to us, okay? So the first thing that Jesus promises to give, he says, come to me all who labored or heavy laden and I will give you rest. So the first thing that Jesus promises to give to you and me, those of us who are kind of worn out and beat up by the world, feeling a little overwhelmed by our circumstances, he promises to give us rest. That sounds really great. But sometimes it's really hard to accept the gift. That's our problem, right? Jesus is saying, come to me and here's what I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you rest. And not just a power nap, not just a good night's rest, not just helping you gain an extra hour of sleep, but he's going to tell us later, I'm going to give you rest for your souls. Because when he's saying all who labor and those of us who are heavy laden, how many of you know the reality of life is that I don't carry my tiredness always in my body, right? It's not always just that like I'm physically tired right? Sometimes we get emotionally tired. Sometimes our our spirit feels worn out, right? We feel like giving up. We're exhausted. I don't have any more to give. I don't have any energy left. All these things. And the kind of rest Jesus is talking about is saying, I want to give rest for that. And here's how he does it. He's, He's telling you to stop and actually rest. I know it's crazy, right? Like, you mean just not do anything for a moment? Yeah. Here, here's an exercise. Let's all just take a moment right now to have a moment of silence. See how long you can go before it feels awkward. Ready? Go. Y'all are doing pretty good. Right? One of the things that is hardest to learn when you do public speaking for a living, they talk to you about this, is learning to pause. Because if I pause, y'all are usually saying anything, because you're good Lutherans. You're just sitting there in silence. And then it can feel what? Awkward, right? We even have that awkward silence. It, it feels awkward to us to what? Rest to actually be still, to to be silent, to to silent your mind, right? How many of you are like, yeah, I could sit here not saying a word for a long time and not feel rested because your mind is still cranking out thoughts or your heart is still cranking out worries and fears. And so here's the decision that Jesus is giving, saying, I'm I'm offering you rest, a different way of living where, where you don't obsess over those things. And we have this choice of life and good, this rest that Jesus offers us. But here's our problem, is so often we feel awkward in the stillness, we feel awkward in the silence, and so what do we do? We get busy. Because busy feels what? Normal. It feels familiar. And so if I don't slow down, if I don't stop, I just keep going, I don't have to like, feel like I'm not in control anymore. I don't have to feel like I'm not in charge anymore. In 1 Peter, the apostle tells us to cast all our fears and anxieties on him because he cares for us. And that's that's how we actually practice this rest that Jesus is inviting us into. Is if I'm still, my fear is what? Who's going to handle all the things? Right? Who's going to handle all the things that I'm concerned about and worried about and need to get done? And Jesus is saying, but how's that going for you? Right? There's a wonderful passage in Matthew where Jesus says, how many of you can add a day or hour to your life by worrying about it? Right? We, we know it doesn't work, but sometimes like the fool, we return to our own folly. And so Jesus is telling you and I, here's an invitation, here's a promise that I wanna give to you. Rest for your souls. 
where you can actually sit in the silence. You can dump out your mind. <laughs> you can pour out your heart upon me because I care for you. And I'm going to carry those burdens for you. And in verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We'll talk about that at the end. He says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So the second thing that Jesus offers you and me, promises you to me, is he's going to be gentle. Anybody ever cried? No. Okay, good. Well, I've cried. It's this emotion that you sometimes feel. All right. But I'm talking about like a good cry, right? Where you were just kind of going through something, life was beating you up, and it just, you tried to talk about it, and no words came out, and you just kind of started crying, right? You just let it out, you get the emotions out. Here's the reality. The world, because of sinfulness and brokenness, is really good at beating us up, right? That's why we feel worn out, run down sometimes. Things don't go right, sickness and death happen, right? Relationships get fractured, work is stressful, whatever it might be. Our future dreams are not exactly what we thought and we just get overwhelmed. And we get beat up. Now the, Jesus is offering us, again, just like Deuteronomy, a way of life and goodness and a, and a way of death. And the way that Jesus invites us to, the promise that he invites us to is him being gentle with us, being kind to us in our frailty, in our weakness, in our brokenness. But the way of the world, the way of being busy all the time and always doing and trying to be perfect, and how many of you have fun trying to keep that facade up, that you got it all together and, you're, and everything's fine, right? Well, that has no gentleness or kindness in it. Right, because that demands what? That I just toughen up, I get over it, I move on, try again, work harder, right? But the invitation of Jesus is, I'm gonna be gentle with you. He knows you and I get worn out, we get exhausted, we get beaten up. And sometimes we don't have the words to say, we're exhausted. And instead of coming to us and saying, I expected better of you. I expected more out of you. I thought you were tougher than that. I thought you were smarter than that. I thought you were better than that. Instead, Jesus comes to us with his grace and mercy. One of my favorite passages is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul is having this conversation with Jesus. And he's crying out and he's praying for this pain and weakness to be taken away. Right? It's a lot of us, right? You got stuff in your life that you're like, just get rid of this heartache, get rid of this pain, get rid of this difficulty, whatever it might be. And Jesus talks to Paul and Tell us, Paul, no, I'm not going to remove that suffering, but here's my promise in the middle of it. My grace is sufficient for you. It's enough for you. And my power is going to be made perfect in weakness. And that's what God's gentleness towards you and me looks like. When you and I get all beat up and, and worn out in this life and we're searching for rest and, and we're doing this thing and that thing to satisfy, he doesn't beat you up and say, you need to be stronger. You need to be tougher, you need to be better. Instead, what he promises is gentleness and kindness. He promises saying, you know, my grace is gonna be sufficient for you in all of those weaknesses. He doesn't condemn you for them. He loves you in them. He gives you grace in them. And then the next thing that Jesus says is he says that he is lowly in heart. And it's juxtaposition be in the Bible, like a haughty or proud heart is someone that is always looking down on others and condemning them and judging them. So another way of saying it is Jesus saying, I'm gentle and full of mercy. Because one of the things that wears us out the most in life is our own mistakes and sins. Sometimes we call them regrets. Sometimes we call it shame. Sometimes we call it guilt. But when I asked you at the very beginning, how many of you have made a bad decision 
an unwise choice. I'm assuming that at some point in your life, one of those poor choices, one of those unwise decisions ended up with the consequence of hurting somebody else, right? Causing pain for somebody else. Now here's how the world works. It demands that we always do better. It demands that we always make up for it, pay things back, make sure that everybody knows we have totally changed and we're not like that anymore. And so what we can do is we can fall into this mentality of always living and always striving of, I've always got to be perfect. I've got to be mistake free. I can't do that again. Even though we all know that we return to our folly all the time. And what Jesus is promising and offering to us who are worn out and heavy laden with our burdens of whatever it might be, including guilt and sin, he's in saying, I am full of mercy for you. He said, no, there's this demand. I, I, I've got to make up for it. I've got to make up for my sins. I've got to make up for my mistakes. And here's what mercy means. It means not getting the punishment that I deserve. That there are consequences, there's a punishment for my sin and your sin that we all deserve. And when Jesus says, hey, but I'm not like the world, I'm full of mercy, saying I'm not going to pour out that condemnation and judgment on you. Of course, the good news of the gospel is ultimately that that judgment and that condemnation is poured out on Christ himself on the cross which is great news for you and me, which is why we know it's true when Jesus says, here's what I offer you. I offer you that I am full of mercy every time you come to me with all of your burdens and all of your sins and all of your brokenness and all of your heartache because we look to the cross and we go, that's where he did it. That's where he kept that promise. In John chapter three, there's this wonderful verse that says, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus is making an invitation to you and I. I. I don't want you to walk down this path of death and condemnation and guilt and shame forever. I want you to walk down this path to the cross where you receive a Savior who is full of mercy and gentleness and kindness for you. Full of grace and forgiveness for you. So these are the things that Jesus promises us. Now the trick is... How do we actually walk in it? <laughs> because Proverbs 26, we're like the dog sometimes. We're like the fool that returns to our own folly, right? right? Well, this is wonderful. Jesus is going to forgive me. Okay, but later this week, you're going to be tempted. You're going to have a choice of, yeah, but I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to do things my way, right? We are so resistant to the rest that he invites us into because we want to do it at our own pace. We want to be in control, right? So Jesus uses this interesting language. He describes it as a yoke. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's teaching us, here's how you live in the rest that he offers. A rest that, you know, eases our burdens. A rest that reminds us that he is gentle and kind when we are worn out. A rest that gives us grace and mercy. So in ancient days when they were in agricultural uh, society they farmed their land with ox and oxen and what they would do to put the oxen in pairs is they would put yokes on them this is how they controlled their pace and helped them turn in the fields so they could plow the fields correctly and one of the things that they did is they would take a mature ox who had lots of experience and knew what the job was and then they would pair them with a young ox and they would put the yoke together so that they would have to walk together. And the reason they developed this practice over time is because they, they realized is, well, the young ox had lots of energy and would just go like crazy with immense speed at the beginning. They could never finish plowing the field because they would always wear themselves out. Anybody ever had a burst of energy? You're like, wow, I got so much done. And then like you're so tired from that burst of energy for the next three weeks, nothing gets done. And then you feel like, great, now I'm behind again, right? 
That's why we do spring cleaning. I know we got a few months before that happens again, but right, you're like, you're like, woo, look at the house, it's all clean. We'll do this again next year. All right, it's the same concept that we get so, oh, I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna do it at my own pace, right? Because I know better than Jesus, right? I'm gonna run at my own pace. I'm gonna be in control. I'm gonna be in charge, and everything in life is gonna be what I say and how I say it. And Jesus says, but I want you to take my yoke upon you. What he's saying is, I want you to walk and live at a different pace of life. Where we learn to walk with him and in his rhythms of grace. Rather than saying, I'm going to charge ahead and I'm going to do it all myself. I'm going to take care of everything on my own. I'm going to carry all the burdens and, all the, and the weight of the yoke all myself. Instead, Jesus is saying, walk with me so you can learn these rhythms and this pacing. And so what they did is they would pair these two together and the young ox would eventually learn how to actually finish the race, how to actually finish the field. And this is why at the end of Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, I, I've finished the race. Because that's the ultimate goal for you and I, is to finish the race, to finish plowing the field, with Jesus. And every time you and I resist and reject this gift of rest that he's offering us and choose our own ways, we're going in a totally different direction. We're doing it ourselves and, and we're doing it our, our own way and that feels great for a little while but eventually it becomes exhausting. And Jesus says, I want you to be with me forever. Not just on Sunday mornings, not just for a little season in your life, but for all eternity. Uh, today we recognize All Saints Day. It's a celebration and a remembrance of all the saints that have gone before us in Christ. The Bible talks about it as people have run the race like St. Paul has finished the race and they are with Jesus now. And this is the promise that Jesus is ultimately inviting you and I into. Is that we would walk with him each and every day here in this life at his pace so that we could finish the race and be with him for all eternity. In Revelation chapter 14, it says, this is a call for endurance of the saints, those who keep faith in Jesus. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Blessed indeed, they now rest from their labors. See, when God says, I'm giving you a choice, life and good, death and evil, Jesus said, I want you to come to me in all your weariness and all your sin and all your brokenness, and I'm going to give you rest. Ultimately, the rest that he's talking about is an eternal rest where we get to rest from our labors, all of our striving to try to fix ourselves and save ourselves. And so he says, I want you to be with me here and now and for all eternity because you kept faith in me and trusted that I have done all the work and all the saving for you. So my hope and prayer for you is that you would walk with Jesus. You would walk at his pace. Sometimes it's okay to take a nap, y'all. Sometimes it's okay to rest and go, Jesus is in control. And he's in such control. He has saved me for here and now and for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that indeed we can rest in your work of the cross and your death for our sins and your resurrection to give us the gift and promise of eternal life. Each day, Lord, help us to rest in your grace, knowing that we belong to you and that we can come to you in all of our weakness and you will receive us with gentleness and kindness. In your name we pray. Amen.